The state fair in 1914 carried the anti-war slogan, flower barrels are better than gun barrels. But the United States entered the war, and Minnesota was a patriotic part of it. Many a Minnesota soldier who had never been out of his own county found himself overseas. Philip Longyear was not a typical soldier. He was rich and well-educated when he went off to fight. When the war broke out, Philip was 21 years old and at Williams College in Massachusetts. With the other young men from the college, he joined the U.S. Army Ambulance Corps. He wrote home to his mother in Minneapolis. Allentown, PA, June 28, 1917. Dear Mother, there are about 3,900 men here, and it looks like a regular war camp. Everything is all bustle and excitement. Everywhere you go, you hear bugles, you see men drilling, etc. We are quartered in the old fair buildings and have one of the stock buildings. Each of us has half a stall to himself. We all eat in one big room underneath the grandstand. Looks like a whole army in there. They're all fine-looking bunch of college boys and treat newcomers as if they were old friends. But when we arrived, everyone shouted at us, Hello, boys! Where are you from? In 1917, about 70% of Minnesotans had either been born in another country or were children of foreign-born people. Almost all were loyal to the United States. But this was a time of super patriotism and paranoia, and the Minnesota legislature created the Public Safety Commission and gave them almost dictatorial powers. They ordered all males over 16 to work or fight, and to suppress disloyalty, they encouraged people to turn in suspicious neighbors. Fred Hausland, St. Paul, October 22, 1918. It has been reported to us that you are not engaged in a regular occupation. You can appreciate at a time like this that no one should be idle. There is work for everyone to do. I would be glad to have you advise this officer whether or not you are employed, and if so, when you entered your present occupation. Public Safety Commission. Dear Commission, I am working in real hard labor too, handling 150 pound potato sacks and other stuff. I was just enjoying a three week vacation, having quit the post office after 11 months service. Sure, a man deserves a three week vacation after working 11 months and not a day off. It was only the spite work of someone whom I've been trying to Americanize, one of our pro-German friends around here. But just the same, I am willing to work. I have a grandmother partial dependent on me, but I claim no exemption willing to fight. Somewhere in France, April 6, 1918. Dear Mother, at last we are here. We just had the censorship rules read to us, and I'm quite discouraged as to what I can write. You'll have to use your imagination as to what I omit. I witnessed my first shell fire day before yesterday, when the French artillery broke up a would-be aerial raid on their town by three German airplanes. I was lying out on the grass in back of my ambulance, reading a Saturday evening post. Certainly was a pretty sight to watch these fluffy balls of bursting shrapnel suddenly appear and remain motionless against the blue sky. Leroy, Minnesota, October 17th, 1917. On October 16th, a transit drove into our garage, a Maxwell Roadster bearing license number 129549, Wisconsin. We, trying to do our duty to our country, pasted a Liberty Bond advertisement on his windshield in the lower right-hand corner. In the morning, the driver came into the garage and seeing same pasted to his windshield, made the following remark. Who in hell pasted that goddamn thing on my windshield? I don't want that damn thing on there. We consider him a slacker and believe he should be taken care of. The potato is a Native American, enlisted to fight against the Kaiser. The potato is a good soldier. Eat it, uniform Wait. and all. Don't eat that slice of bread. Have another potato instead. Make your motto. To Berlin via tuber. Weed is needed in the front line trenches over there. Let potatoes serve as home guard over here. The newest fighting corps. 
The Patriots! Join the ranks and spud the Kaiser. I'm betting my life you'll do your job. June 14, 1918. Well, we've gotten to work at last. And this is the first time in several days, oh, I can't even figure out how many, that I've had time to do anything. I have seen enough wounded to last me for the rest of the war, as far as curiosity goes. I've just gotten through cleaning the blood out of my car and it was hardly a pleasant job. I didn't mind the shells and gas as much as I did the sights and the smells I had to go through. After five days, during which they had no time to care for the dead, the battlefield was hardly appetizing. I became so sick and disheartened at times when I was almost too tired to drive that I would have given anything to have been away from all the revolting sights. It all seemed so futile. To the Commission. Dear Sirs, I desire to ask whether or not moving picture operators, having no other employment, come within the provisions of Order 37, the work or fight order. There are two young men here in that class who do nothing whatever except to drive around with young girls and flivvers all day and turn a crank for an hour or two in the evening. I am one of the peace officers appointed by your body and desire to assist in all ways in the enforcement of your orders. November 15, 1918. Well, the event has happened at last and none is more pleased than I am. I can imagine what must have been going on in any town in the States on the night of the 11th and would have given anything to have been there. But the jubilation and excitement over here was about as great as it could be. When the news of the signing of the armistice came in, all whistles and bells began blowing and everybody rushed out in the street. Then, a bunch of us decided to walk to the next town where they were having a real dance in a regular hall with an American band. That turned out to be the worst ride I ever hoped to get in. Everyone grabbed the person nearest and tried to dance. The first dance, I got a hold of an old man about 80 years old, so drunk he couldn't tell his hand from his foot. He cut the most extraordinary capers, dancing up and down, waving his arms and legs without noticing who was next to him. Everyone laughed and whooped till the tears came and they were hoarse. Philip made it home. He married and had a daughter. In 1931, at the age of 35, the glider he was piloting crashed, and he was killed. Those who desire to dance the shimmy will have to confine their activities to some other place than Hibbing, says Mrs. Pritchard, policewoman who posted regulations in all the public dance halls of Hibbing this week. Neither will cheek-to-cheek -cheek dancing be tolerated. With the notices posted were photographs of the correct position, at least the only position to be tolerated in the dance halls of Hibbing. This means that dancers must hold their partners at a distance. Strict regulations are the result of the many public dances held in Hibbing where there were no regulations as to the method of dancing. And cheek to cheek, sometimes even closer, was the rule, not the exception. Hibbing Daily Tribune, February 23, 1922. Minnesota was hit hard by the Depression. One fifth of all Minnesotans were out of work. 35,000 in Minneapolis alone. On the Iron Range, it was 70% unemployment.
William Haas of St. Paul was a 49-year-old contractor. He filled out an application for a federal job in 1934. Know something of building construction. Know something of bridge construction. Know something of dam construction. No sewers. No costs. Can organize. Can tell the other fellow what to do and how to do it. Know if he's doing it, whether the water boy or the engineer of civil science. Experience. 1926-1927, superintendent of a construction job, Chicago, 400 a week. 1926 to 1930, subcontracting road construction, Arkansas and Oklahoma. December 19th, 1930, the Christmas present, ruptured appendix, all of 1931 unable to work. Nineteen thirty two to nineteen thirty three, begging for a chance to work. The hardest work I ever did. Linda and her husband, William Bennett, began farming near Hastings in nineteen thirty on the land they named Apple Acres Farm. It was the start of a decade marked by sagging crop prices and drought. Even with the hardships, they were happy working the land. Linda kept a lifelong correspondence with her friend, Nellie Hubble, whom she called Hubby. For four long years, a succession of actual wars and constant crises have shaken the entire world and have threatened in each case September 28, 1938. Dear hubby, William has driven to an electric show in Dakota County, and while he contacts the people he has to see, I seize the chance to write to you. It seems as though all our thoughts and hearts these days are absorbed by the European crisis. When I am at home or candling in the poultry house, I have the radio going steadily and thus keep in close touch with each new development as fast as it happens. Tomorrow, Hitler, Mussolini, and Chamberlain meet in Munich. What will become of it? By the time this letter reaches you, we should know whether it is peace or war in the immediate future. And war in Europe means war for us, too. Let us not delude ourselves about that. As individuals, we can do little but we can live in the agony of suspense of every European each hour that passes. We shall truly pray that Hitler's enormous egotism may feel a check in the world disapproved of his militant methods and empirical aims. In the meantime, we go on living our lives of daily routine while we hang on the abyss for our civilization. Hens lay eggs, Hitler or no Hitler, Crops must be harvested when ripe and the weather permits. Little pigs eat and grow. Children must go to our democratic schools, etc. So we cut our corn, shuck it, cut hay and stack it, grade our eggs and market them, kill a fine beef for our own table and put it in frozen storage for the use during the coming year. And all the time we draw nearer to the brink. At every hour of the day, you are, I believe, the most enlightened and the best informed people in all the world. Must go now to the chicks to put them to bed. Good night, dear girl, and love always, Linda.
Bring Warm Clothes is made possible in part by Target Stores, Dayton's, and Mervyn's through the Dayton Hudson Foundation and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the Central Educational Network. This program was produced by KTCA, a Minnesota original.